some of the riskiest digital activity that we perform in our lives is done in a web browser. A huge amount of malicious activity goes on in the browser, and it's really hard to make a judgment decision on which websites to trust. I just mentioned LinkedIn, Dropbox, and MySpace. Now, any reasonable person would trust these websites. They're very well-recognized brands. We'd have no reason to be suspicious. But collectively, they lost nearly 600 million records because of security flaws in their websites. One of the problems that we have as everyday users of websites is that it's very hard to make judgment decisions about how secure the site is. In fact, there's really only one obvious independent means of verification of a website's security profile. Let me show you what that is. Let's take Veronis as an example. And you'll see one indicator of security here in the browser. And it's the padlock at the start of the address bar. We can drill down into this padlock. And in the Chrome browser, I can click on Details for some more information. Here we can see the browser telling us that this page is secure because it has valid HTTPS. It then goes on and talks about certificates which we can drill down and view, but we're not going to do that here. What I want to do is talk about what HTTPS is. Why are we seeing that green padlock? And indeed, why does it even matter? Let's go and take a look. HTTPS is a really important, really fundamental security control on the web. Let's talk about how it works. And in order to illustrate this, let's first think about what happens when a PC makes a request over the internet. So imagine the PC or the smartphone or the tablet that you're watching this course on at the moment. It's probably going to be connected to a Wi-Fi network. So your web traffic is going to go from the device that you're on now across a wireless network. Now, anyone controlling that wireless network can intercept the traffic. And that's just the start, because from there, the connection goes out via an ISP and then out over the internet and then eventually to the server that has loaded this content. Anyone who can get in the middle of any of that traffic can read any unencrypted traffic. We've seen many examples in the past of malicious activity such as rogue Wi-Fi hotspots. You think you're connected to the cafe or the airport or somewhere that should be perfectly legitimate, but someone with malicious intent is running it and they're watching your traffic. ISPs are increasingly watching your traffic. And then as we get to the internet itself, that traffic goes through a number of different servers and often a number of different countries between the ISP and eventually the server. There are a lot of different points where we need to trust those that are handling the data. Now, what HTTPS does is gives us a mechanism where the traffic gets encrypted on the device itself before it even goes out over the wire or the wireless, as it may be. What that means is that when that traffic does leave the device, it's all encrypted. So all of these points between the PC and the server, where it's eventually decrypted, can't read the traffic. So you have confidentiality. No one else has seen your traffic. And they can't modify it either. So you have integrity. They haven't changed your traffic to say something else. Now, that's really important when we talk about things like passwords. We don't want any of these other parties between your device and the site that you're talking to to be able to see your password. When you browse a website like your bank, you want to be able to get back your balances, your account activity, without any of these parties being able to observe what's going on. And indeed, when you load those pages, you want to know that they haven't been tampered with. You want to know that an attacker hasn't put something malicious on a website that you've loaded. And this is one of the things that HTTPS does well. 
Now, none of this is to say that the server itself doesn't have serious security vulnerabilities on it. LinkedIn and Dropbox and MySpace all had HTTPS, but they also had some pretty serious security flaws on the server itself. So it's important to recognize what this padlock does and does not mean. Yes, it means your traffic is protected. No, it doesn't mean that the server itself is immune from any major problems. So that's HTTPS. Let's go and look at another really important service for protecting your online activity, and that's VPNs. A VPN, or a virtual private network, is another way of protecting your data as it flows across the internet. There are many consumer-orientated VPN products these days. VPNs that can run on your mobile devices and on your PC. And they often cost a mere few dollars a month. Let's talk about how they work. We'll go back to our PC, and again, it could also be a mobile device like a phone or a tablet. And the PC is connecting out over the internet. Now we know from the previous slide that in order to get to the internet, it probably goes through some Wi-Fi and it goes through an ISP. And then eventually that traffic ends up over on the destination server. Now let's imagine you do want to use Wi-Fi in a location that you can't completely trust. Imagine you're at an airport in a foreign country and you can't necessarily rely on every service that you're using to implement HTTPS correctly. Many services still don't have it at all. So being a cautious individual, you don't connect to the internet. Instead, you run a VPN client. So when you run a VPN in this fashion, you do have software that runs on your local device. And that's the client that we see here on the slide. That's just part of the picture because you also need to have a VPN provider. Now there are quite a number of good providers and as I mentioned before, they're often just a few dollars a month. And what's going to happen when we run the VPN client on the device is it's going to encrypt the traffic all the way through to the VPN provider before it then goes out through the internet again and eventually to the target website. Now there's a couple of important things to note here. One is that the Wi-Fi and the ISP are inside that encrypted traffic box. They cannot see your traffic when you have a VPN. The other thing to note though, is that you are now trusting this VPN provider with your traffic because they're going to decrypt it before they send it out over the internet. So you need to have a VPN provider that you trust. Now this isn't foolproof, so we still have a segment there of the connection after the VPN provider where the traffic is not necessarily encrypted. If you go to a website with HTTP in the address bar, it's still going to go through that point on the diagram without any protection. But if you have an HTTPS connection, as we just saw on the previous slide, then we know that's already encrypted. And now that encrypted communication is going to go through the VPN, which also encrypts it, and you get two levels of encryption. A VPN is a great solution for when you need that extra confidence that your traffic is encrypted. So that's the role of a VPN, and that's enough for encrypted traffic. Let's go on and have a look at something else that happens at an alarming rate on the web, and that's phishing attacks. Phishing attacks should be familiar to you because you have almost certainly received them in the past. You'll probably find that most phishing attacks that come via email just go straight to your junk mail, which is a good thing, but occasionally you may also see one make its way into your inbox. So let's go through how it works. You get an email from someone who's ultimately running a scam and the email entices you to go to a phishing page. So this is just a website, but it's going to ask for some very particular information. We'll have a look at one in a moment. You fill in the information requested on the phishing page. So for example, your PayPal credentials, that's a popular phishing scam. And those credentials 
are then sent off to an attacker. So they've now got your PayPal username and password. That sounds very simple, and it is. Phishing attacks are normally extremely trivial, but they're also very effective. Let me give you an example of a phishing email. I literally received this one today into my inbox. This is precisely the email I received. And when you have a look at this mail, you realize that there's a few things that just don't add up. So firstly, it's representing itself as having come from Microsoft, yet there's no Microsoft branding, which would be quite unusual for an email from a company like that. The grammar is also bad. It says, your account will reactivate it. Very unusual for a company like Microsoft to get their grammar so bad. There's also a sense of urgency. It's prompting me into action. Someone would read this and say, well, yes, I would actually like to reactivate my email account. And phishing scams frequently rely on this human vulnerability, which is responding to a sense of urgency. Now, this is quite frankly a pretty bad looking phishing email, although it did actually make its way into my inbox. When you see an email like this, it's important just to delete it. Don't click on any links. Often these links will actually track who's clicked on them. And in doing so, you've just verified that you are a real person receiving these messages and you're willing to click links. Not just that, but you may then end up on a website which may be worse than just trying to extract information from you. It may also load malicious software into your browser that exploits out-of-date applications on your machine. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. For now, though, let me go and show you another phishing scam email and an easy way to check whether it's legitimate or not. This one is actually quite a bit more convincing than the one I just showed you. It's allegedly from PayPal. It's got the PayPal branding. It's presented in a much nicer way. But there's one obvious sign that this is a phishing attack. I've received this on my iPhone and I have tapped and held on the link in the email. Now, you've got to be careful here because I just mentioned you don't want to actually click on it and load the page. But by clicking and holding, I've been able to see a little indication of where that link actually goes. We can see here that it goes to an address which is bit.ly. Now, bit.ly is a URL shortener. And what that means is that behind this link, there's another link. And that's going to take me somewhere completely different. They've used bit.ly here to obfuscate or hide the URL that we would go to if we clicked on it normally. And that is a dead giveaway. If you get an email from a company like PayPal and the links don't go to paypal.com, you know it's almost certainly going to be a phishing scam. Let's now have a look at just what a phishing page looks like. Here's the one that's loaded from that Microsoft Outlook phishing scam I showed you earlier. And this is a very good looking phishing page. It looks like a normal Microsoft sign-in page. It's got the Microsoft branding, it's asking for email address and password, and pretty much everything looks normal. Until you look at the address bar and you see that this is not Microsoft.com and it's not anything that looks anything like Microsoft.com. Not only that, but there's no padlock. And we know now that if there is no padlock, we can't trust the page. This phishing page is actually running on a compromised website. So this is someone else's website that attackers have broken into and loaded this malicious page onto. If you get an email from a website like PayPal asking you to log into your account, don't click any links at all. Open up your browser and type in the address yourself, paypal.com. You know that's where they are. You'll be able to find any calls to action after you log in. So that's websites. Let's move on now and have a chat about software maintenance. 